And we are pleased to welcome the Chief Economist and the Senior Vice President of the World Bank, Justin Yifu Lin. It's nice to have you in Canada, and I guess more importantly, in that chair right now. Welcome to TVO and welcome to Canada. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. You have a very important job, and I guess we want to start by asking, what do you do? Well, I would say every job is important. Certainly, my job is important also. And uh, my main function at World Bank as a chief economist and a senior vice president. First one, I am the chief advisor to the president on economic issues. Secondly, I'm the head of the research department of the World Bank. Third one, I'm the spokesperson for the World Bank about the global economic issue. Last one, I'm the advocate for our clients' country in developing country. And I need to take care of their needs and uh, to advocate on behalf of them. So the advice that you give to the head of the World Bank literally can change the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world. Hope that will be the result. But that is, you, I mean, you have that kind of influence, am I right? Uh, to some extent, yes. We try our best to help the people to develop their economy, to increase their income, to reduce the poverty, to cope with the global challenges. Now, as a Chinese man, you are, I think, I think I'm right in saying, the first person to have this job from a country in the developing world as opposed to the developed world. And I wonder what uh, you think that says about the influence of the developing world. Well, first, I'm a lucky person. And uh, secondly, that reflect, you know, we are changing into uh, some kind of multi growth world. In the past, the knowledge of development was generated in a high-income country, then those kind of knowledge will be used to help the developing country. Mm -hmm. But I think now we are changing into a new global era that the useful development knowledge will be generated in a high-income country, but also in a developing country. And so we need to have this kind of two-way, three-way exchanges. We need to continue to have the north-south learning we also need to have the South-South learning, and we also need to have a South-North learning. And I think my appointment reflect this kind of new global era. Well, you will forgive my, and I think our, our viewers as well, interest in your own personal story because you are so unique to the job, but you have a very distinctive personal story. We know lots of people who have defected from the People's Republic of China to other countries but you're from Taiwan, and you defected to the PRC. Now, that's different. Can you tell us why you did that? Uh, first, I need to collect the use of one world. Okay. I did not defect. Defect is a bad word. What would, what, what's a better uh, just, word? Just like Obama, he grew up in Hawaii, and he returned to mainland US. And I grew up in Taiwan. It's part of China. I went back from Taiwan. To mainland China. That's not a great analogy. There's no state of war between Hawaii and mainland United States. Taiwan and China, they're not best friends. Well, but it should be. And that should be the goal we work for. Okay, let's tell the story though. You, as a young man, yeah. you swam from Taiwan to mainland China. Swimming is a very good export. <laughs> I'd like to promote that. <laughs> and you can see that I have a very good sporty body. You're in very good shape, there's no doubt about it. But why did you do that? Why did you want to leave Taiwan for, the, for communist China? Well, you know, I'm a person like history, and in a historical train. I think one China is good for everyone in both sides of the street. I like to make a contribution because I'm a person of knowledge integrated with action, I think. That is my goal, and I hope I can make a contribution to the modernization, to the peaceful unification of China. You think you can do that? Well, a small part. Play a small part. Yeah. Now, when you finished your swim and you arrived on the shores of the mainland, uh, you know, they, they didn't have a parade for you. I think you were met by soldiers, were you not? Uh, certainly. Well, you know, it's, you understand under that kind of situation, uh, people welcome me, but they like to understand how come I'm there. And what did you tell them? I told them I want to return home, I want to make a contribution. Now you say return home, but that never was home for you. Taiwan was home. No, my forefather came from mainland. 
your forefathers. Yeah. Okay. Now, if I have the story right, and you'll help me again yeah. if I've got this wrong, when you left Taiwan, yeah. uh, you had a pregnant wife who was being left behind, right? Is that uh, right? That's true, but uh, you know, I wanted to choose an opportunity which I can you know, return to mainland China, and uh, I will not cause any harm to my family, to my superior, to my colleagues. And so that time was the best moment for me to do that. OK. And what, uh, you know, if, if it's none of my business, you tell me it's none of my business. <laughs> but what happened to your wife and child? Well, you know, my wife, she is very supportive. And so she wait the opportunity to go to the US. And so we you know, met again in the US. And then he returned to China together with my children. And so we are unified again. You are reunified. Yeah. OK. You changed your name. Your name used to be, and I, I won't pronounce it properly, yeah. but I'll try, Zhang Ji. Yeah. And you changed it to Lin Yi Fu. Yeah. How come? Well, you know, uh, as I mentioned, I don't want it to, I did not want it to bring any trouble to my friends, to my families, mm -hmm. and uh, to, you know, evaporate. And uh, so for that, I changed my name. But the name, I choose it myself with special meaning. What does it mean? The meaning is persistence. I need to be persistent your to pursue my own goal. Your new name means? Persistence. Persistence. Persistence in what? In pursuing what you believe. OK. Can you go back to Taiwan? Hopefully. But not now, right? Well, I'll say no later. So probably later. If you go back now, they're going to arrest you, aren't they? Oh, uh, well, uh, I, uh, I never try. And I don't want to cause trouble to my friends there. And so I know the moment will come. but. You know, China has 5,000 years of history, so I don't you know, care to wait a few more months mm -hmm. or more years. But you still have family in Taiwan? Uh, except for my nuclear family, my wife and my children, all my relatives are in Taiwan. OK. Let's talk some economics now. Thank you for That's indulging our, our, our curiosity <laughs> on uh, the rest of that. You did a PhD in economics at the University of Chicago right. in the early 1980s. Now, this is a school that is renowned for pumping out Milton Friedman disciples who are, you know, big into conservative, uh, f you know, economics and free yeah. market principles and all of that. Uh, how influential was all of that in how you do your job now? Well, I think that my training in Chicago is extremely important for me because what I learned in Chicago is that you need to use your theory to explain the phenomenon. And the theory need to be you know, consistent in its internal logic. But at the same time, the theory need to be consistent with the phenomena mm -hmm. you observe. And those kind of training is very important for me. When I go back to China, you know, certainly I try to understand the phenomena. I try to develop my own theory. And it should be consistent internally in terms of logic. And you should also be able to predict, to explain what happened, okay, but to you're help not, with the policies. You, you don't describe yourself as a disciple of Milton Friedman, though, do you? In that regard, I am yes, because you know, Milton Friedman has a very important contribution to the economic you know, profession called the methodology of positive economics. And what I describe just that methodology. So I learned the methodology from Chicago. And those kind of methodology is so important for me to perform my job in China and also to perform my job as a World Bank chief economist. OK. You, I've seen you use the expression, though, in some of your writings, the advantages of backwardness. Yeah. What is that a reference to? That means that you know, if you look into the economic development in any country, it's a process. It's a process of continuous technological innovation industrial upgrading, industrial diversification, institutional innovation. And uh, for the high-income countries, advanced countries, their industries, technologies, institutions are on the global frontiers. And uh, for the further development, they need to invent those kind of technology, industry, institution. 
but for a low-income country, they can learn from the high-income country. They can avoid you know, uh, the mistakes, and they can introduce innovation at a low cost. Those kind of possibility we call advantage of backwardness. Do you think it's pejorative to say backwardness? Uh, well, you can turn backwardness into an advantage. Into an advantage, I understand. Yeah. Well, in fact, you talk about China's comparative advantages. Do you want to go into that a little bit? Tell us what you think is on that list? Yes, you know, China at this stage is the most important advantage is that it has abundant able, well educated, disciplined. And, you know, because the supply is so large compared to the capital availabilities, so wage rate is relatively low. And so China can go into labor intensive type of productions and uh, produce good at a low cost and become very competitive. And that competitive create job in China, provide cheap good for the world, so it's good for China for the world. How much longer do you think Chinese workers will be satisfied being paid so much less than their colleagues around the world? Well, it's a process. But if China continues this path, you know, Chinese products are competitive, and a Chinese company will make a profit, they will make more investment, and the government also will make more investment in education and so on. And with that, labor productivity will increase, and wage rate will increase. So as you observe, in the last two or three years, wage in China increased very substantially. Substantially, even, you think? Yeah, even in this global crisis. Like the beginning of this year, I'm sure you must hear a lot of newspaper report. A lot of factory in China, they increased the wage. 20%, 30%, some even 50%. From a very low base rate, though. Yeah, well, yeah. but it's a process. You it's know. a process. Everyone started from low income. Can I also tell you what I've heard from China, which yeah. is very disturbing news? Workers are killing themselves. They're upset with corruption. They're upset with the state of, uh, the state of play in their factories. Yeah. And they are killing themselves. What do you read into that? Well, you know, certainly you know, China has 1.3 billion populations. And China has about 500 billion workers, a uh, million workers. 500 million, yes. Yeah. And yeah. so those kind of incidents will occur. Just like if you go to the street in the US, you're going to see someone being hit by a car every day, right? But newspaper always like to report those kind of incidents. Is China still too corrupt for your liking? Well, that always in a relative speaking. Mm -hmm. I'm sure corruption exists in China, and I'm sure corruption exists in any other country also. Canada but too. everything is in relative in a scale. I have one indicator. That is to see the quality of highways. Because highway is always a large project and a very easy subject to corruption. And the more corrupt, the less quality of the highway. Hmm. And I'm sure in the highway construction in China, in the last few years, expand so rapidly. And there must be quite a number of corruption. But at the same time, I need to say, compare the quality of highway in China, it's much better than many, many other places in the world. Better than here? Better than the United States? Uh, I would say so, because the highway in China is new. The highway in the US is old. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, well, I don't know if this is a, a bit of a tangent on that, but um, China's adapted what you call a dual-track approach. And part of that involves, I guess, protecting uh, businesses, companies, sectors of the economy, which are non-viable. Do you think this is a wise thing to do in this day and age? Well, that depends on your starting point. Mm -hmm. Because China started in 1979, before 1979, China had a planning economy. And uh, under the planning economy, like many other socialist countries, well, not only socialist country, actually, like all other developing countries, at that time, the government wanted to develop certain industry, very capital intensive, very large scale, very modern. But they went against the competitive advantage of their economy. And so the government created all kinds of distortion to protect them, to subsidize them. Mm -hmm. Certainly, China needs to go away from those kind of system. It's a process. It's a process. 
and the process that if you wanted to remove all those kind of distortion immediately, then those sectors will collapse. It's going to create a huge unemployment and social instability. So over what period of time do you think that process needs to make its way through? Well, it certainly also depends, right? <laughs> and so at the beginning, China adopted some kind of dual track approach, mm -hmm. continue to provide some kind of transitionary protection to the old sectors. But liberalize the entry to the sector which are labor intensive, small scale, consistent with China's competitive advantages. And those kind of liberalization create you know, the competitiveness, dynamism, the job in China. And, and, and with that kind of dynamism, it create the material base to solve the issue in all sectors. Hmm. And I'd like to say that you know, China has gone quite far away from the old system. But certainly, there are some remaining distortion in the Chinese system, and that need to be tackled. That need to be further improved. Tell me whether you think this is a distortion in the Chinese system. We have heard a lot about the Chinese economic miracle mm. and about the opening up of Chinese uh, society, the Chinese economy, in order to uh, bring hundreds of millions yeah. of people out of poverty, and the success has been spectacular. You have That's growth great. rates in China that we can only dream about here. We don't hear similar stories about political reform. Yeah. Why not? Well, actually, political reform also engage in China every day. Every day? Yeah, like 30 years ago, you could not imagine I sit here to discuss the question with you. And not only 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it was invisible. So it's changing all the time. It depends on how you define political reform. In terms of freedom, participation, and what that I can see, China made a lot of progress. And uh, well, for you, you may think that the political reform in China uh, 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 did not you know, progress as fast as the economic reform because you used the Western standards. Mm -hmm. you know, it did not have a universal election yet. And uh, sometimes you use that as the only criterion. But we know more important thing is to bring the freedom, the possibility to the people. And uh, that can you know, allow them to make a choice by themselves. At the same time, allow them to participate actively in the economic prosperities. And for that, I think China made a lot of stride already. Are you annoyed when Western observers constantly point to China and say, you, you know, <coughs> there's no respect for human rights, you're not a, you, you, you continue to be an authoritarian capitalistic system. You have no interest in opening up the political process. Does that bother you to see those kinds of criticisms? Well, I've been used to those kind of criticism. And just like in the past 30 years, people constantly predict when Chinese system is going to collapse. And they've always but been wrong. It has been so dynamic for 30 years. And if I look beyond in the coming 20, 30 years, I still have a strong confidence. The economic prosperity, the social uh, transformation in China will continue. China is now about to rival the United States in terms of its economic prowess. And of course, we hear that they've got all the money in the bank. Uh, and, um, but I want to put these numbers up here, because this may actually, you can look on the monitor here. You know these numbers better than anybody. Michael, let's put this graph up. Here's the GDP per capita, and let's just compare. GDP per capita in U.S. Yeah. dollars, there's the United States at 46,000, Canada right. just over 38,000, South Korea 28,000, and despite the Chinese yeah. economic miracle, $6,700 is the GDP per capita in yeah. China. Is China a rich country? Well, you know, that you have two dimensions. Mm -hmm. One is aggregate size, and the other one is per capita income divided by the population. If you divide the Chinese GDP by the population, as you indicated, the per capita income in China, measured by purchasing power parity, is only about 6,700 US dollars. And it's just a fraction of the US per capita income. Mm -hmm. But if you multiply that per capita income by 1.3 billion population, it's a big size. And when we say China is the second largest economy in the world, it's in aggregate sense. But if you look into the stage of development, China is still a middle-income country. 
Do you think China sees the United States as a rival that it wants to um, surpass? Well, Chinese people certainly have the goal of increase its income, its you know, uh, uh, labor development, just like the people in any country have a similar aspiration. I mean in world influence. Uh, and, and, and then, because of the size, certainly it will have a larger impact on the world economy. And, but I'd like to say, yes, it's going to increase its impact. But at the same time, it also opened up a lot of opportunity for other countries. But I'm wondering whether you think that uh, Canadians, and more particularly Americans, should look at China as a country that wants to rival America for supremacy in the world, not just economically, but in terms of international affairs, diplomacy, war making. What's your view? I, you know, I'm a strong believer of Chinese philosophy. I think the best world is a world without dominance. Is a world? Without dominance, dominant in power. Without dominance, okay. Yeah, you, you know, all the power are roughly in the same size, competing with each others, and not big brothers that will be good for the whole world. Is the Chinese model exportable? Uh, well, in spirit, there are some lessons we can learn from China. But certainly, you cannot transplant the Chinese model into other countries, just like you cannot transplant the US model to Canada, and uh, you cannot transplant the US uh, Canada model uh, uh, to Mexico, and you cannot transplant the US model to China either, and certainly, we cannot transplant the Chinese model to any other country in the world. But there are some spirit that we can learn from the development process and the transition process in China as well as in other countries. Well, that's what, let me follow up on that uh, in our last minute or so here. And that is, I, I, people are wondering where to put their bets these days. Hmm. Would you put your bet with democratic capitalism, with Western values, with the way the West has done things? Or would you bet on authoritarian capitalism where they don't have to worry about the niceties of environmental assessment hearings and human rights and that kind of thing? Where do you put your bet? Uh, well, I think that, uh, you know, first I'd like to say the model you describe is not the model uh, in the realities. Because in China, certainly the government has a larger influence on the economy and so on. But the government needs to take care of the people. Any government needs to be supported by the people. And to be supported by the people, the government to care about the needs of the people. And, and, uh, and uh, you can see that in the past 30 years, the poverty in China reduced dramatically. Mm -hmm. 600 million of people get out of poverty. And you can also see the investment in the education, in the health, in the environment, all those things has been happening. So it's not an authoritarian government which did not pay attention to the needs of the people. It's an authoritarian government that is paying attention to the needs of the people. Is that what you mean? Uh, it's a government that pays the, paying the needs to the people. And uh, the government is in, uh, you know, inherited from the past and uh, try to improve the system all the time. We uh, look forward to seeing the results of your persistence in your relatively new job as Chief Economist and Senior VP of the World Bank, Justin Yifu Lin. Thank you for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thank you very much for this opportunity to exchange a view with you. It's and our my pleasure. best wishes. Xie Xie. Xie Xie.